Hi, I'm uh, Thomas, uh, here to talk about uh, determinism in games. Uh, so predicting the future and returning to the past with determinism. Uh, so the context of the talk is I spent the last four years until I got laid off five months ago or so uh, working on Earthless, which is a roguelike deck builder uh, with a turn-based, grid-based system. Um, and I was talking with the Darkest Dungeon guys, and, uh, what was it? Yeah. Uh, talking with the Darkest Dungeon guys about how we did prediction about what the player's input will be. Because um, it's actually like uh, kind of complicated to do in turn-based games, and it turns out we built a pretty novel system, so I thought I'd talk a bit about it. Uh, so I mentioned turn-based, I should explain that as a general concept. Um, so it's a philosophical concept for most people. Uh, if you believe in a purely physical world um, run by rules, then theoretically uh, you can determine anything if you the state of everything at once because it's run by rules. Uh, so as a random philosophy 101 question, uh, for anyone who has this opinion of the universe, uh, do you think free will exists if you can be predicted with 100% accuracy? Uh, but this is for games, so we can actually make a deterministic world. Uh, because it's all just code and you can control it. And compilers are mostly deterministic outside of floating points. Um, so, there are some advantages to doing this. Most games don't, but uh, you get some big, big advantages. First, uh, if you know the state of the game um, at a given point, and you know the rules of the game, then you can theoretically go backwards. Uh, so, this enables things like rollback netcode, which if you're a fighting game player, you probably already know. Uh, second, um, if you start at the same place on multiple machines at, with the same 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 seed and same data, uh, and you have a perfectly deterministic engine, all you need to do is know what all of the actions are to be able to replicate, which I'll explain later. And the final one, the main reason we use it for, is you can start from the player state as is and test what they would happen if they did a certain input, that like move or attack. Uh, which is the main use case for this. Uh, so this is an example of rollback echo, the best uh, movie picture I can find uh, that explains it. So on the left here, uh, we have player one playing and player two. Oh, player one and player two are clicking a button at the same time. Screen left is player one, screen two is player uh, two, one. Mix that up. Anyways, uh, importantly, the player one and player two have their avatars jump as soon as they press the button. Um, and then they see the other person's jump when the signal arrives. Uh, but if you notice, the jump isn't delayed, it snaps in position for the other player's avatar on your screen, uh, because as soon as the input arrives, it goes, okay, this person played it, I uh, pressed jump a little while ago, so actually they should be a little bit higher than if like, they just started the jump this frame, they should be started about 0.5 seconds ago, and it snaps in place. Um, so this is very useful for games that care about uh, really precise positioning, uh, like uh, fighting games is a big one, um, because it means that your input can be instantaneous without being wrong. Uh, you don't have to wait for the other person to receive your data and validate it. Um, the other one uh, is I'm, I'm pretty old, I guess, these days. I played this game on dialogue as a child. Uh, it had hundreds of units on a like phone connection, uh, which has absolutely no upload or download. Um, and it did it by using determinism. It started with the seed of a map uh, and the fashions player chose. And then it only passed the instructions the players used at any given tick. Uh, so a normal game, it would have been now, you normally pass the serialized state of every object. So like a player will be rotated and at a certain position, and that will be assigned across. Um, but when you have dial-up speeds and 200 units, that is a lot of data. Um, so they have to use determinism to make it work, which is probably part of the reason why RTS is dominated in the 90s, because with limited internet connections, they were actually like the most neat multiplayer games you could really play. Uh, and how it worked was, um, like I said, they don't pass the space of the units, like a Zergling isn't passing its rotation and its location and attack state. It passes, okay, player one told five, unit, five Zerglings to attack move towards grid 100, 112 on frame, or tick, 150. Um, and then both players seek uh, games, replicate the exact same actions, which require you to be very precise when programming, 
But if you do it, then you can do this. So finally, our use case. Uh, so this is Earthless. Um, and here we can see a few uh, units previewed. So I'm, I'm in this, this picture uh, testing how to move to the top right or top middle right there and holding down tab to do the preview. Uh, it will then show all of the enemy's locations and enemy's attacks that will happen um, when I move there. If I end the turn after moving there. And you can do this for anything. Right? By your card, you can see the preview. That's going to die. Um, and if you're going to just end turn, you can hold tab to see what damage is done. So why, why is this really important? So for Earthless, like I mentioned, we're like that color. Uh, importantly, defense system like Slay the Spire. Uh, it's also grid based. So Slay the Spire has a very limited amount of information it has to convey. A grid based game has a lot more because there's a lot more units and a lot more space. Uh, also, we want a complex action and trigger system and multiplayer. And also, uh, like, the whole team was coming from RTS games anyway, so we already knew how to build a deterministic engine. Uh, so, Slay the Spire. Uh, the big innovation it made was it always shows the enemy's intents and the defense system expires at the end of the turn. So it makes the game about uh, having a short-term damage block, uh, this turn, you have to damage block them, and a long-term goal to defeat the enemies. Uh, this meant that your turn is about building up enough defense to meet the minimum amount you need, and then uh, attack. Um, so that's very important in this sort of genre of game. So you need to see intents, but we're a grid-based game. Grid-based games, uh, like Into the Breach, um, do a lot of information conveyance, but it does it by stripping out most of the complexity of the game. Uh, it's like referenced a lot by designers, but I consider it more a puzzle game uh, than a strategy game, because they stripped out so much variability and complexity for the intention system. We didn't want to do that. Um, so that's like the logic there. Uh, now, how is it done? Oh, well, also multiplayer is just uh, it's easy, very easy to network a deterministic engine because you just pass your commands. Uh, how is it done? So, uh, in this case, you split the sim and the press. So normally a game has like both of those combined. You have a, a unit, it'll have health, and it also have like a reference to the renderer. It all exists in the giant uh, combination thing. Um, in this, you have a sim unit and a pres unit, and the sim unit controls where the pres unit goes, but it's entirely independent. And in this case, the game is also entirely in C sharp. Outside of you, you can compile and run inside of it. Um, so, the in this case, Unity, which was our engine uh, of choice, sends the commands from press. Like the player would click on the button, the game would interpret the intention there, like oh, they're doing the command. And we send a new command. Uh, and then that receive, simulation receives it, which could be on a server because, it, again, it's pure C sharp code. Um, and then it processes it, does its whole thing in simulation, like, okay, they're going to move here. They're going to trigger any move actions, or trigger move action, any like, events like moving over lines, uh, and so on, to stop the energy from moving. Um, and then all of those are actions. Every, every change to the game happens in action, which, by the way, uh, so the side note, it was very hard for new programmers who came onto the project to understand this because you cannot change the variables outside of actions or the whole thing works because there's multiple simulations changing one place to the other. It was a real hassle. Every, every single um, code review, I had to ping someone for the first two months. Um, but anyway, so yeah, it sends back all of the actions to the presentation and uh, the presentation sim, uh, sim uh, now has it, like the local sim sim. Um, and now it just renders it. Like, it's like, okay, this player moves. So we'll pause processing actions and move the player. Player's there, okay, now we'll do the energy dodge. And so, and the presentation, once it's fully synced up, is matching the presentation and simulation set. Okay, and I explained all this when I went to the slide, but an important aspect of those actions is that they're atomic. They only do one thing, um, because otherwise it's, it's super complicated, because they need to be uh, condensed and change state in an understandable way. And that's super reversible, because uh, if you're doing rollback that code, you need to go backwards. Um, and yeah, here, those are examples like gave, stat, move, trigger, etc. Um, and how we preview it is uh, if you have the sim state and the pres state, uh, you can also build a new one, preview state. 
if the player does something, or wants to see if they can do something, you can send the action command, command uh, to the preview state. So it's like, okay, what happens if I move here and enter? You just send those commands to that state, and it render, renders the same way. And that's exactly what happened with some And uh, we also did have, as mentioned, multiplayer. Um, so you can do all that. Uh, if two players move into the same spot, you can have the first player instantly move without having to wait, and then roll back. Uh, okay, I've time, so I can finish this. Um, and yeah, if, if you, most of the time, when doing this rollback networking, um, like, the, the actions, the commands did not interfere with one another. If two players move to the same location, it's an issue. But if they move to different ones, it's fine. So it actually made networking very fast-paced for a simultaneous experience for both players. They go back at the same time without really any interference with each other. Okay, questions? Oh yeah, I'm giving it. Probably, probably try. Okay. Watch out, yelling it. I can just copy it out. You. Okay, I'm saying really loudly. Okay. <laughs> All right. So this uh, net code stuff is pretty interesting. I was wondering how this could be related to online chess and how. Um, one player can move a chess piece, and then the other person sees that move. Uh, so the question was, how does it relate to uh, chess networking? It's like being able to see other people's move. Um, I mean, yes, it would work quite well for that, because you can then see what the player intends. Um, but chess is inherently a uh, ego ego system, um, so it's not strictly necessary. The, the, the big advantage here was it was simultaneous, and so it allowed uh, one player to go at the same time as the other without having to wait. So chess, I don't think it's a big deal having to wait for the person because that's inherent to the game design. Uh, one other advantage um, of a system like this um, might be for something like um, replays and otherwise, um, because you condense a replay from being like you have to save the whole game state continuously, continuously to just this is the actions that we're taking from this point to this point. Um, one question that I think you didn't mention, uh, sort of in the answer, how do you handle randomness within a deterministic system? That's good. Oh, okay. Who's that? Uh, yeah, so randomness. So yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I'm guessing you're also RTS dev. Um, so randomness, we had a few different seats. So we would have a random seat at the start, and then um, in action, it was a quad, sorry, pseudo random. So uh, you could iterate on it, and every individual time you call that seed, it would have a deterministic result for the next one. Um, and so we would pass in the seed at the start of the game, and it would have a reliable thing, and you increment it backwards in your So you just decrease the count for the pseudo random, and it would have the uh, same results as before. Connecting back to the previous talk um, with what you just said, um, could someone theoretically like uh, intercept that packet of data and see that random seed and, and know like the next ten possible moves? One hundred percent. <laughs> uh, cool talk, Thomas. Is there, are there any like unused applications of this that you're kind of hoping to see leverage in the future for like different genres or other designs? I mean, rollback netcode is pretty interesting for any like game that cares about latency. I mean, uh, Stormgate, which I was hopeful for, but hasn't been doing great. Uh, a recent RTS like advertised rollback netcode. Um, so it is starting to make its way out of end games. I would say that's the most common use case, um, but anything that wants to be reversible or predictable does benefit from this. So I think turn-based games actually are a pretty good like use case for it. We have, like I said, like, that's one of the reasons I did this talk, is the only case I've seen of it in turn-based games is Earthless, because we all were RTS devs before, but I think it could be used for that quite uh, nicely. Thank you uh, for listening. <laughs>